Now that we've talked about memory controllers quite a bit uh, in detail, uh, hopefully you have a good perspective of how important they are. And I think, as I mentioned, uh, the importance of memory controllers is going to only increase going into the future. And again, we have these controllers all over the system. Uh, and now we're going to look into one of the key things a memory controller needs to handle. Uh, and this is really the issue of memory interference and quality of service. Uh, in addition to everything else we've discussed so far. Uh, but let me motivate the uh, need for this uh, a little bit. I'm going to go through some of these relatively quickly because you've discussed some of these. But if you look at the memory system, it's a huge shared resource. You remember this picture multiple times you've seen it. And I've used this picture to say that most of the system that we designed today is dedicated to storing and moving data. That's true. And on top of that, most of that system is really shared. Basically, the main memory system is really shared across different agents, whether they be cores or accelerators, uh, GPUs, CPUs, uh, machine learning accelerators, et cetera, video encoders or decoders. They're really sharing uh, a good chunk of the memory system, some levels of caches, memory controllers, interconnect, shared memory storage, et cetera. Basically, most of the memory system is really a shared resource. So what is the resource sharing? Resource sharing is essentially a very simple concept, but uh, it's a very fundamental concept. Instead of dedicating a hardware resource to a hardware context, you allow multiple you allow multiple contexts to use it. And there could be many, many context uh, resources like functional units, pipeline, caches, buses, memory interconnects, and storage. And in some levels of sharing, even functional units are shared. For example, in uh, multi-threading, uh, Intel calls it hyper-threading, but simultaneous multi-threading uh, functional units are shared across different uh, threads, hardware contexts. So why do we do this? Clearly. It improves utilization and efficiency. Uh, uh, and in, as a result, it improves through overall throughput. When a resource is left idle by one thread, another thread can use it. There's no need to replicate shared data uh, clearly. So this is good. And this is, I mean, it's clearly a human uh, uh, concept from the nature also, right? Uh, I don't know, maybe human concept. Uh, if uh, clearly we don't have one store uh, that sells things for every single person that lives in the world, where we have a single store and a lot of people go to that store and shop at the same time, uh, hopefully not too close to each other during these times, uh, although I see that being violated many, many times in Zurich. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, people share resources and a shared store is one shared resource, clearly. Uh, and there's nothing uh, different in computers a shared, uh, if you think of memory, it's also a shared store, right? You, 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 you store the data over there and everybody goes to the same shared resource to access it. Uh, the other benefit of resource sharing is reduced communication latency. For example, uh, you can keep the same shared data in the same cache in simultaneously multi-thread processors and uh, different threads can access that data uh, from the same cache, L1 cache, let's say, and different threads may be scheduled on that uh, uh, core that has that cache, right? So this reduces the communication latency for this shared data. And on top of that, this is compatible with the shared memory model, uh, which we have been discussing. If you share memory across different threads, uh, sharing the resource uh, or data, uh, plus where the data is stored also makes sense. But of course, resource sharing has disadvantages as well. This re results in contention for resources. When the resource is not idle, Another thread cannot use it, if or uh, or if the, if there's a bandwidth resource, for example, like in memory, or if the space is occupied by another thread, by one thread, another thread needs to reoccupy it. Uh, so this happens in caches, for example, or main memory. Uh, so the, uh, as a result, this contention sometimes reduces each or some threads' performance, and thread performance can be worse than when it's run alone. So uh, imagine that there are two threads uh, that require that are accessing the same bank that require different rows. They basically trash each, other, each other's row buffer in this case. Well, there's only one row buffer, row buffer but they request trash the row buffer. As a result, the performance of each thread is much, much worse than compared to when it's run alone. When it's run alone, it may be, both threads may be getting row hits in that row buffer, right? This eliminates performance isolation. As we've discussed in the past, in, you get inconsistent performance across different runs depending on which thread you're running with. Uh, now thread performance depends on co-executing threads. And you get, uh, if, if the sharing is uncontrolled, meaning free for all, there's no control over it, 
but this degrades QoS. Basically, aggressive threats uh, get the resources, uh, and it causes unfairness and starvation. And clearly, you can guess this may be actually the case in human life also, right? Uh, if, if you have resource sharing, uh, and if you don't have some sort of fairness in how the resources are managed, some bully uh, may actually get all the resources because they're aggressive and they're more powerful uh, than you in some way, right? Uh, as a result, you may actually starve. And that's really not the way things should go clearly, right? Uh, because that's clearly unfair. Well, the same thing applies to programs as well. Uh, basically, uh, there's a need to efficiently and fairly utilize shared resources when you have resource sharing. Uh, this is important. Uh, now, there may be cases where you don't care about fairness, uh, but I think I would argue that even if you really care about overall performance, overall throughput, fairness is really important because overall throughput depends on how much progress different uh, agents, execution agents, like computation agents are making cores, for example, if you unfairly treat one of them or many of them, let's say, then uh, you may not be utilizing your computation resources really well because they may not be making progress as we've discussed in the past. Okay, very quickly, this is an example of uh, with shared caches. Let's assume that you have these two threads, thread one and thread two running on different cores. Initially, thread one runs by itself and it's, you can see that it occupies a lot of space in L2. Uh, thread two also needs a lot of space in L2, but when they're run together, uh, somehow thread one is more aggressive and it basically uh, destroys thread two's throughput by occupying a lot more space than thread two in the shared cache. Well, this could be actually even worse, right? For example, thread one may have a data set size that's much larger than the L2 cache. It may be streaming through memory. It may be basically bringing gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes of data without reusing them, right? Whereas thread two may have some data set that nicely fits into L2 if it were running alone. But when it's running together with thread one on processor core one, then its data set doesn't fit into L2 anymore because it, gets, it, it keeps getting kicked out by the streaming requests of huge amounts of data that's brought in by uh, T1. So clearly this issue exists in caches as well and their papers related to it. This is one early paper that talks about it. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, this idea. We're going to focus more on memory, main memory side. And there's a lot of work in caches actually. Uh, and recently, uh, processor manufacturers have introduced uh, cache sharing mechanisms, cache partitioning mechanisms to uh, overcome the, these problems. None of them are, in my opinion, perfect uh, because there could be better automated ways of dealing with this problem. For example, machine learning based policies could be a great way of looking into this partitioning problem, cache partitioning across different uh, processors, uh, but existing systems are not as intelligent, let's say. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that. You can look at Intel's uh, cache allocation technology, for example, uh, which is essentially a cache partitioning technology that uh, does some cache partitioning. But at least uh, people are recognizing the difficulty of the problem and they're adding support into the hardware. So, okay, why is this bad? Uh, clearly, um, uh, unpredictable performance or lack of quality of service bad because it makes programmers' life difficult. An optimized program may get very low performance and you have no idea why. Uh, and the performance varies widely depending on core runners. Uh, so this is a good argument for performance isolation. So you optimize your program greatly and in the end it runs terrible because somebody else is destroying the performance of the cache that you think you had to begin with, right? That's why cache partitioning is important. You can optimize your programs assuming some level of cache, some amount of cache now. Okay, so this causes discomfort to users. Some important program can starve. And uh, there are many examples of, from shared resources like shared software resources. For example, at some point, I think Microsoft had uh, the storage system or locking system shared between Excel, PowerPoint, and Word, let's say. And whenever you had some sort of uh, heavy access in one of those programs to storage, uh, because there was shared locking, that happened across these three different programs, you could not basically get work done in the other program. So you could not do a good PowerPoint presentation or uh, editing when your Excel was actually uh, mm, accessing some shared resource like storage. So this is a bad design clearly, but this is an example of 
uh, discomfort that's caused the user from shared software resources and similar things happen in hardware as well. And uh, not having quality of service or having, uh, having unpredictable performance is also, also makes uh, system management difficult because if you're a cloud provider, for example, or if you're a mobile system designer, how do you, how do you enable a service level agreement? How do you keep your user happy uh, while uh, maximizing your efficiency by sharing hardware resources? Uh, you may not be able to satisfy strict service level agreements. And as a result, you may lose efficiency in your data center by running only one workload in a rack, let's say, uh, not sharing resources in the rack. Uh, and that clearly leads to energy inefficiency, that clearly leads to uh, performance, uh, overall throughput degradation, uh, and sustainability issues also, because these data centers consume huge amounts of power and cooling. Uh, and uh, they actually makes uh, uh, increasing their inefficiency is basically very bad for sustainability and nature. Okay, so resource sharing versus partitioning. Clearly sharing improves throughput by enabling better utilization of space. Partitioning, on the other hand, provides performance isolation and predictable performance because each thread gets its dedicated space. The key question is, of course, can we get the benefits of both? And we're gonna see some examples of this. So the idea is to design shared resources such that they're efficiently utilized, controllable, and partitionable. And we're gonna see some examples of this in the memory controller space here. But essentially we want no wasted resource. We don't want to dedicate resources when a thread is not using them. But on top of this, we want quality of service mechanisms for different threads. And as we've seen, memory system is the major shared resource. Threads request interfere in the memory system. And it's going to be much more of a shared resource in the future as you've seen in the earlier example with memory controllers that have uh, many agents accessing them and many hybrid memories that they're going to control. So uh, the problem with inter-threaded application interference is threads may share the memory system, but the memory system doesn't distinguish between different threads requests. And this was true for memory controllers. This is becoming better also in existing systems, but there's more need to be uh, more work that needs to be done going into the future. Uh, so at the time these slides were written, existing memory systems were completely free for all. They're shared based on demand. And control algorithms as a result were thread unaware and a thread unaware. As a result, aggressive threads denied service to others. Uh, this is because existing systems didn't control or reduce inter-thread inter interference. And you already know the example of memory performance attacks. We had a full lecture on this. So I'm not going to repeat these slides, but I'm going to jog your memory by just animating them. Clearly, if you have uncontrolled interference, you can write even memory performance hogs like this, that hog uh, the row buffer or the bank uh, versus some other thread. And as a result, and this is because of the way DRM controllers are designed as we've discussed multiple times, but we also discuss discussed in the previous part of today. And as a result, these pr uh, real performance hog hogs can uh, slow down other applications as you can see over here. And this becomes a greater problem with more cores. Essentially, you have an uncontrollable and unpredictable system. And I've also shown you that you can also do distributed denial of service in uh, these network on chip based systems that are really uh, the next step in the evolution of multi core engines so that we can scale them up to many, many cores. Okay. And uh, as I said, you, uh, we've already covered this in this lecture and this YouTube video points to that lecture in case you were not present or in case you want to jog your memory. So we've also briefly discussed this uh, in that lecture. So the key question is, of course, how do we solve the problem? And we've discussed briefly some potential directions, but we've never gone into a lot of detail. So we're going to go into a little bit more detail. So basically, inter-thread interference is uncontrolled in all memory resources, memory control, interconnecting caches. As I said, it's getting better today. Uh, but the question is, how do we control it? Uh, basically, we want to design interference aware or quality of service aware memory system. And there are many high level questions or high level challenges to design this sort of system. So I'm going to give you the high level questions first. So first of all, I believe as much as possible, we want to reduce inter-thread interference uh, because reducing this improves system performance and core utilization and can reduce request serialization and core starvation. So if you can reduce it, that's great. And there are multiple ideas related to it. Again, I don't have time to cover all of them, but partitioning uh, badly interfering programs to different memory channels is one idea. That's called memory channel partitioning. It was first published in a paper that we wrote in Micro in 2011. Uh, it's a very simple idea, clearly. Uh, but basically, if you partition badly interfering programs, uh, 
to a different memory channel such that they don't interfere with each other in the memory controllers, that's great. So clearly you need to do it carefully, et cetera, but you can read the paper, memory channel partitioning paper. And uh, I will ask my TAs uh, to actually put that up as one of the suggested readings uh, because we're not going to get to it today. Uh, but that's one example of reducing interthread interference. The second is if you cannot reduce interthread interference, at least control interthread interference. Uh, basically provide mechanisms to enable system software to enforce quality of service policies while providing high system performance. So this requires some fairness mechanisms in the memory controller, caches, et cetera, uh, maybe partitioning mechanisms. And of course, we want to do this while providing as high performance as possible because if you lose, uh, otherwise the problem is really easy and you lose efficiency if you don't have high system performance. Basically, uh, one way of controlling it is, is uh, ensuring that a thread that's important uh, gets allocated its own core and that uh, core uh, doesn't uh, interfere with any other, uh, gets interfered with other cores. So this doesn't sound good, of course. On top of this, we want to make the memory system configurable and flexible because it's in the end, the goal is really quality of service. We want to enable flexible mechanisms that can achieve many goals. You want to provide fairness and or throughput when needed or a combination of both. You want to satisfy performance guarantees when needed and different agents have completely different guarantees. For example, my GPU has a frames per second requirement, which is a bandwidth guarantee, uh, which can be translated into memory request scheduling speed or bandwidth. Uh, some other uh, machine learning accelerator may have a latency bound. For example, the sensor that you employ uh, in your self-driving car to detect a stop sign clearly has a latency bound. It's not a bandwidth problem, right, at that point. You really need to react uh, with some latency. And that needs to be translated into uh, the memory system requirements and request latencies, et cetera. So clearly, uh, there's a high level, application level uh, requirement that needs to be satisfied, that needs to get translated into the memory system. And as a result, the memory system needs, really needs to be configurable, flexible. And there may be cases where you don't really care. You just really care about overall system throughput because all applications are equal priority. There are no strict latency and bandwidth bounds. As a result, uh, we want to maximize system throughput. To be able to do that, you need some notion of fairness as we discussed, but you need to be able to communicate all of these different goals to the memory system in an intelligent way. So the memory system needs to be aware of these. So I think all of these are required to really build a quality of service aware memory system. And I think these are all exciting topics. We will see some examples of ideas toward these. Uh, the, uh, there are ideas toward this also, but I think we can do a lot better uh, in terms of the, especially the third bullet, but also in the first two bullets. Again, uh, I will say that there are not a lot of works in this direction, but using machine learning to handle all of this is actually a really promising direction also. How do you use machine learning to answer all of these three questions at the same time or individually is important. I'm gonna give you a lot of heuristic based human design methods from the perspective of the memory controllers in, this, in the remaining part of this lecture. Uh, but I leave you to imagine machine learning based policies, which I think it can be much more effective assuming they're designed well. Okay, so there are also two approaches to designing quality of service uh, memory, uh, where memory systems. Uh, one I call smart resources. Uh, basically you have many shared resources, memory controllers, interconnects and caches being uh, three things that are on chip, but they're storage of course. Uh, so smart resources uh, is an approach where you design each shared resource to have a configurable interference control and reduction, basically memory quality of service mechanism. Memory controller has it, interconnect has it, caches have it, and you combine all of them together and hope that all of them coordinate nicely and work well with each other. Usually not. You combine different quality of service mechanisms that you design in memory control, interconnect and caches. Sometimes they go against each other, unfortunately. Memory control may prioritize one thread caches may prioritize some other threat at, the, at that point in time. And as a result, you may actually lose overall efficiency and performance. So this approach, while interesting and important and should be followed in my opinion, you need to coordinate between these different quality of service mechanisms somehow. And there are papers that show that. The other approach is uh, dumb resources. Basically keep the resources dumb, exactly the opposite of this, free for all, as we designed them today, for example, but reduce or control interference by injection control or data mapping. And the idea here is these resources are a cloud of resources. Uh, they exist, 
but cores or agents are injecting requests into this cloud of resources, and we can throttle them, for example. So if we find uh, add enough monitoring mechanisms into uh, the system, such that we know who's causing the unfairness, who's, who's hogging the resources, which resources potentially, and then basically we throttle the hog uh, or the, uh, the program that's uh, causing unfairness such that it doesn't inject as many requests. So this is one approach, the source throttling to control access to the shared resources. And it's possible to do this clearly, except you need to keep track of some metadata uh, to understand who is the culprit, let's say, uh, and who is being affected, because you may want to throttle up the, uh, the application that's not getting its fair share as well. Uh, I, I mentioned the data mapping, quality of service where data mapping to different memory controllers, memory channel partitioning is one example. Uh, so that's also an example of dumb resources approach uh, in the extreme case, of course. And uh, the last one is thread scheduling to core. So if two threads are not uh, interacting nicely with each other, they're badly interfering with each other, why not schedule them to separate uh, chips, for example, such that they don't interact with each other? That's the idea over here. Of course, uh, this works if you have enough threads to schedule uh, to keep your resources busy, chips busier. So these are all examples of dumb resource approaches. They don't mess with or change the algorithms and the memory controllers, interconnects and caches. Instead, they do something else to reduce or control interference, thread scheduling, data mapping, source throttling. Of course, these two things can be combined with each other, uh, which, and then things become much more effective as our memory channel partitioning from micro 2011, for example, shows. Uh, and also the source, source throttling paper uh, uh, that we had written in uh, ASPOS 2010 also shows, but I'm not going to go into the details of that. Keep in mind that these are not, or not necessarily uh, non-combinable mechanisms. They, they can be complementary to each other. Okay, we don't have time to cover everything in this lecture. At some point, we may go into dumb resources and tell you more, but if you're really interested in this direction, I'd recommend, for example, the fairness via source throttling paper from S plus 2010. My TAs again can put them online. And uh, the memory channel partitioning paper from micro 2011 uh, to see examples of these dumb resource approach. And I believe this is actually a nice approach also. The caveats are, it may not be always possible to do this uh, when threads don't have, uh, you don't have enough diversity in the threads. Uh, where smart resources manage uh, so the big upside over here is you can actually eliminate interference as much as possible. Whereas here, uh, you may not be able to eliminate interference because you already have requests in the memory controllers, for example, uh, if you don't combine it with dumb resources techniques, but you do prioritization and you can actually fix something when the interference cannot be eliminated, right? Or reduce the impact of interference as much as possible. So we're gonna talk a lot about quality of service or memory controllers. Uh, since this lecture is about memory controllers, and you're going to be able to, you're going to actually design uh, some of these algorithms that we will hopefully get to in your lab three. Okay, so let's, uh, but before we go into memory controllers, let me actually talk about these fundamental interference control techni uh, techniques that are uh, covering the space of these smart and dumb resources. So one is prioritization or request scheduling, which we're going to talk a lot about. The other is data mapping to different banks, channels, ranks. I told you about memory channel partitioning, but there are a lot of works that built on what I just discussed that do bank partitioning. Subarray level partitioning is another possibility. Uh, core and source throttling is another one. And thread or application scheduling is another one. I'm giving you examples of this in the previous slide. So let me talk about prioritization or request scheduling in the context of memory controllers. And we're going to talk about interference aware or quality of service aware memory scheduling in the rest of this lecture. So again, we're gonna focus on memory controller and memory controller resolves memory contention by scheduling requests. The key question is how do we schedule requests to provide high system performance, high fairness to applications and configurable to system software. In this case, memory control needs to be aware of threats. So I'm going to give you an evolution of quality of service aware memory scheduling uh, from my perspective. Uh, this work that we started in 2006 actually has had a lot of impact. A lot of the ideas over here went into different types of products. And some of these ideas went into products that I'm not aware of as much, or I should not be aware of as much. Uh, but uh, this is a set of summary slides that go through the ideas. Uh, and again, I'm not gonna go through these slides at this point, uh, some of these works that we're gonna cover, but it's good to summarize everything with uh, an idea and takeaways. 
And again, I'm going to go through these slides. We're going to cover some of these works. I'm not sure if we're going to get to everything, uh, but you can you can look at the uh, slides uh, to get to everything if you're really interested. So hopefully we'll get to Bliss because this is something you're going to implement in your uh, lab. You're going to also implement Atlas, uh, but you should be happy that you're not implementing something like Dash because this is one of the more complicated schedulers. Why? Because it handles a lot of cases. So here, basically, if you look at a system that has CPUs, GPUs, and hardware accelerators, and the key goal is to ensure that you everybody meets their deadlines, and you also maximize system performance at the same time. So to be able to do that, your idea needs to be very heterogeneous. And you can see the idea is described in five lines over here. Uh, and uh, the takeaway also needs to be carefully done over here. Basically, basically, you need to ensure that hardware accelerators are making good progress to meet their deadlines. GPU is making good progress to meet its deadlines. While CPUs, uh, different cores are also making good progress to uh, get latency and system performance high, uh, latency to be low and system performance to be high. And this paper proposes, this is really the state of the art system on a chip scheduler that's published, I should say. Uh, this paper basically shows a sch that scheduler can meet all of the deadlines of the hardware accelerators while maximizing system performance compared to all of the other schedulers that are previously described. But these all other schedulers are not solving exactly the same problem. They're actually solving a simpler problem, as you will see also uh, in your lab assignment. You're, you're not going to be implementing a full uh, deadline of our scheduler because you're going to be looking at a multi-core system as opposed to a system that has CPUs, GPUs, and hardware accelerators. So basically, keep in mind that the lab you're doing is a great lab, but it doesn't consider all of the complexity in a real system. So if you consider all of the complexity, the lab would be a lot more complex. But I think what you're going to gain from the lab is going to be good enough to understand uh, the problem. That's why we actually simplified it uh, to be that level. So keep in mind that we're not going to talk about prefetches in this particular lecture, but prefetches need to be prioritized accordingly also. Uh, and there are multiple works that talk, and talk, that, talk about that. And also rights need to be prioritized accordingly, even though we're not going to talk about rights a lot. Um, I've already talked about it in the previous lecture 11 11A, but in this case, uh, there's more to be done in this area and rights need to be prioritized carefully also. So we're going to ignore some of the complexity still. So the complexity is really a lot actually. It's not just different requests from different threads. It's also, are they prefetches? Are they demands? Um, are they uh, rights? Are they reads? Uh, and uh, do they have deadlines? Do they not have deadlines, etc.? So we're going to ignore all of that complexity. Uh, and uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, new memory technologies like phase change memory, which this paper examines, also have specific issues, especially with writes and reads. Uh, why? Because writes are 10 times slower, for example, than reads in some of the technologies, maybe more than 10 times slower in some of these technologies. As a result, you need to be really, really careful about write requests. And there, there are schedules that are designed for that purpose. And uh, of course, you can take into account criticality in requests uh, even more uh, for CPUs as well as GPUs. And GPUs are a place where uh, latency criticality also matters, but also CPUs is a place where that matters. So taking into account criticality is also important. We're not going to talk about criticality uh, in the rest of this talk, but criticality is how how important is this request for performance? If you delay it a little bit, is it going to hurt your performance significantly or do you have some slack in terms of delaying it? Okay, and there's even more harder real-time systems that we have also examined. Basically hard real-time systems are, if you miss the deadline, somebody dies. Of course, clearly this is bad, right? This is really somebody potentially dies, let's say. And of course, uh, there's no, this is a serious problem uh, with self-driving cars, uh, airline uh, systems, etc. Here, you really need to be very extremely careful. And whenever you're doing, whenever you're doing designing uh, any system, anything for those sort of type of systems, software, hardware, you need to really be extremely careful. And uh, this paper talks about scheduling policies uh, for that purpose, which I'm not going to talk about. So keep, uh, this, this, is, this was to give you a broader view of the broader perspective of how difficult the problem really is. But let's talk about some simple ideas that can make a difference, even in this difficult uh, problem space. And I'm going to start with this idea. Uh, remember this picture that I showed you earlier? You have unfairness in the memory system. Uh, 
and uh, the memory controller is unfair. As a result, uh, some applications slow down a lot, some applications slow down by little. As a result, you have uncontrollable, unpredictable system. So how do we solve the problem? This was our first solution to the problem after we discovered the problem and made the world aware of it. And the idea is called stall time fair memory scheduling. Uh, the goal is to uh, have uh, uh, essentially threads sharing main memory should experience similar slowdowns uh, compared to when they're run alone on the same system. That's the definition of pair scheduling in this case. Uh, and uh, this is a good definition at some level because it improves overall system performance by ensuring cores make some proportional progress. So the question is how do you implement this goal? And it turns out it's very difficult, it's not easy. You will see there's a lot of complexity in the paper if you read it, even though it's a pioneering paper that showed that this can be a good direction. Uh, later, we simplified a lot of the mechanisms. So basically, the idea is uh, to is a bit uh, idealistic, let's say, to have the memory control estimate each thread's slowdown due to interference and schedule the request in a way to balance the slowdowns. I'm not going to go into how we exactly do this, except for the slide very quickly. But basically, we define a memory system to be fair if it equalizes slowdown of equal priority threads relative to when each thread is run alone on the same system. So you need to calculate the slowdowns basically somehow. And this is not easy, basically. Uh, so the way we try to approximate this is we this define something called DRM related stall time of a thread. This is the time a thread spends waiting for DRM memory. Uh, so stall time shared is DRM related stall time when the thread runs with other threads. So whenever the thread is running with other threads, you can get this value more or less accurately, right? By looking at how often, how many cycles the thread stalls because it has a DRM request outstanding, okay? The difficult part is stall time alone. This is the DRM related stall time when the thread runs alone. Well, the thread is not running alone. How do you get this value? Well, you can stop the thread, and stop all of the other threads and run just this thread. Yes, you will get stall time alone. Well, that will be terrible for throughput because you're stopping everybody else. That's not good to begin with. Uh, but on top of that, you may not be accurate also because you're really looking at stall time alone in a different phase of the program in that case. Right? So this is a messy problem. What we did in this work is we estimated it somehow. And we estimated it based on the dynamic requests that are being scheduled. Whenever a request is being delayed, uh, we basically increment some counter, excess cycle counters, which I'm not going to go into uh, in this description. But basically, assume that you estimate it in some way. Now the memory slowdown of a thread is stall time shared divided by stall time alone compared to when it's run alone. This is the relative increase in stall time, okay? And the stall time fair memory scheduler aims to equalize memory slowdown for interfering threads without sacrificing performance. So it considers inherent DRM performance of each thread and it aims to allow proportional progress of threads. For example, uh, if, if a thread uh, is, is slowed down by 10 times, another thread is slowed down by two times, uh, hopefully this will be reflected in the memory slowdown, right? Okay. Uh, and if, uh, and, and you take into account stall time alone, basically, if your stall time alone is one and stall time shared is five, you get five X slowdown clearly in the memory slowdown. If your stall time alone is 10 and you get your stall time shared is 15, uh, then you get 1.5 X slowdown. Okay. Okay, very quickly, the algorithm is this way. Uh, for each thread, the DRAM controller tracks ST shared and estimates stall time alone. As I said, this may not be very accurate and it's not easy. Assume that it's estimated in some way. Each cycle, the DRAM controller computes some sort of uh, the slowdown value for threads with legal requests. Legal requests are requests that can be scheduled without having conflicts or data corruption, uh, basically obeying timing constraints and resource constraints. And it computes an unfairness value. This is the max slowdown value divided by min slowdown value. Okay. If unfairness is less than some alpha, the memory control uses DRAM throughput oriented scheduling policy. Otherwise, the DRAM throughput switches to a fairness oriented scheduling policy where it, requ it schedules requests from threads with the maximum slowdown first. And if all else being equal, it schedules requests for a row hit first. Otherwise, it schedules requests with all this first. Okay. So very quickly, basically the algorithm operates this way. Uh, it basically keeps track of the slowdown of different threads in hardware and it has unfairness, which is the division of these two. And it has a maximum tolerable unfairness, which is configured by the system software. And whenever this unfairness value is greater than maximum tolerable unfairness, the algorithm switches to a, a fairness oriented scheduling policy where it prioritizes the thread that is slowed down the most. Okay, that's the basic idea. It's very simple. 
The rest is bookkeeping and ensuring that these values are computed correct. Let's take a look at this example of uh, random and stream that we've seen in the past. Basically, uh, you can see that as the memory controller schedules a request to the row buffer, row hits, slowdown of thread one increases. And at some point, the slowdown of thread one is greater than the, uh, the unfairness is greater than the alpha value. As a result, the memory controller switches to scheduling requests from thread uh, that has been slowed down the most, which is the red thread, as opposed to scheduling requests from the thread that is sitting in the row buffer, right? So it switches between to a fairness oriented scheduling policy. Uh, by doing that, it reduces the slowdown of thread one and increases the slowdown of thread zero. So unfairness becomes in check. Now it can switch back to throughput oriented scheduling policy. And then at some point, again, the unfairness becomes unbearable. As a result, the memory controller switches to the fairness oriented scheduling policy and that reduces unfairness. And as a result, uh, the memory controller switches back to the throughput oriented scheduling policy. So this is how the memory controller works. And this sounds good, right? Exactly. This is really the first algorithm for pair multi-core memory scheduling. It provides a mechanism to estimate memory slowdown of a thread. That's also nice potentially, but it's not very accurate. It's good at providing fairness and being fair can improve performance because now you're not delaying uh, some cores, right? You're basically improving core utilization. The downside, of course, is it doesn't handle all types of interference. It's complex to implement and slowdown estimations can be incorrect actually. And these are wildly incorrect, but still it works because we're not really relying on slowdown estimations being perfectly correct. As long as you get the relative slowdowns reasonably correct, such that you can switch to the right policy at the right time, then you can actually keep the slowdowns in check. Okay, so if you're interested, you can read this paper for more detail. I have not assigned this uh, uh, since it's superseded by other papers like this one, which I will talk about. Okay, I will keep going unless there are questions. I don't see any questions, but feel free to either interrupt or ask questions. Okay, so this work is very interesting, actually. Uh, this is the next work, and uh, a lot of the ideas in this work actually went into some SOC, system on chip memory controllers. But let's see uh, what we're missing. Actually, the problem is even more, even worse than what we've discussed. Uh, so uh, you, you probably know that processors are designed to tolerate the latency of memory requests by generating multiple outstanding requests. This idea is called memory level parallelism. And there are many, uh, a lot of machinery, hardware machinery that's built into existing processors, auto order execution, non-blocking caches, run at execution, that essentially generate many outstanding requests as much as possible by the program. And the goal is to overlap the latencies of the requests such that they're serviced in different banks. But this is only effective if the DRAM control actually services the multiple requests in parallel in DRAM banks. If it does something else, if it really destroys this parallelism, then you have a problem. And we found out in this work that multiple threads share the DRAM controller. Well, we didn't find that out, we know that. But because the DRAM controllers are not aware of a thread's memory level parallelism, they can destroy this bank level parallelism of each thread. As a result, they can service each thread's outstanding request serially and not in parallel. So let's take a look at this. I'll demonstrate this pictorially. So let's assume that you are running this thread A and you have only two banks in the system for simplicity uh, and the thread is running alone. It computes. It basically reaches two cache misses, two DRAM requests. And these DRAM requests are sent to the memory controller. And during uh, the time these DRAM requests are serviced in the different banks, in mostly concurrently, mostly parallel, uh, the thread stalls, right? Because it doesn't have the data yet. Then the thread receives the first data back but it cannot compute because it's still waiting for the other data. And then the thread receives the second data back and then it starts computing. So you see what happened over here. The thread stalled only once for two requests because the bank access latencies of the two requests were actually overlapped. So this is the beauty of overlapping uh, the request uh, latencies. Well, I'm of course exaggerating here. I'm not look I'm looking at, I'm not actually giving you the correct picture of other parts of the request, basically the serialized parts, the memory bus, and maybe some other parts. Uh, but actually the bank access latency can dominate, uh, assuming you have bank conflicts, especially. Uh, but it doesn't matter. Even if you don't have bank conflicts, the bank access latency is long. So you're overlapping the bank access latency, essentially. So as a result, you're stalling approximately for one bank access latency in the thread, even though you have two requests. That's good. 
Now let's take a look at, and this is happening because you can do out of order execution. You can generate the second request while you're stalling or while you're stalling for one request because you can look ahead, let's say. Okay, let's say you, uh, you have uh, two threads and that behave, they behave exactly the same. Two different programs, let's say, A and B, but they do the same thing. They compute, at some point they reach two cache messages each and the, their four, two DRM requests each are sent to the DRM controller in this order. And let's assume that the DRM controller services the request in the order that I show you over here. It first picks thread A's request to bank zero and schedules it. And then it picks thread B's request to bank one and schedules it. And during this time, the requ two requests are being serviced, both of the threads stall, as you can see. And then the bank zero is done. It sends back thread A's request. And then it, uh, the memory controller picks the next item in bank zero, uh, first come first serve, let's say. And it basically schedules it to bank zero. Now the data is sent back to thread, thread A, but thread A cannot continue because it still has one more request outstanding. Uh, at a similar time, uh, the next uh, time point, let's say, bank one uh, finishes servicing thread B's request and thread B receives the data, but thread B cannot continue because it's still waiting for one more request in bank zero to be serviced. Now the memory controller takes thread A's request to bank one and schedules it after bank one becomes free. Now, while these two requests are being serviced, both of the threads continue stalling. So they stop stalling only when the requests are done, as you can see. So you can see what happened over here. Even though each thread had two requests, uh, they were serialized. Bank access latencies of each thread were serialized. Each thread stalls for approximately two bank access latencies. So this is completely the opposite of what we've seen earlier for, for a given thread. Okay, the question is, of course, can we do better? Uh, there's something the memory controller is doing here that's not good, not nice, let's say. It's basically destroying the bank level parallelism of both of these threads. And can we do better than this? And uh, that's the idea basically over here. The parallelism aware scheduler is not going to destroy the bank level parallelism of the requests. What it's going to do is uh, basically the same scenario, A and B send two requests each to the memory controller, memory controller gets two requests from each thread. And it first takes thread A's request to bank zero and schedules it. And then instead of taking thread B's request to bank one, it says, oh, I have another request from thread A to bank one. So I'm going to prioritize that so that I'm not going to destroy the bank level parallelism of thread A, which I already scheduled to bank zero. That's the idea. And then thread A's requests get serviced. Thread B's requests are clearly not being serviced. So thread B and thread A both stall. But some magic happens. Uh, well, uh, what, what happens, not, not magic, of course, but the beauty of uh, thinking here is that when bank zero is done with thread A's request, it sends the data back. When bank one is done with thread A's request, it sends the data back. And once thread A's request data gets back, thread A can continue computation. And that's the magic part. It's not magic, clearly. We designed the scheduler to be parallelism aware, such that it can enable the computation uh, or less stalling of threads. Thread B clearly continues stalling because its requests are still being serviced in parallel, but it didn't lose anything. Meaning it basically finishes computation just like it would over here at the same time, but thread A gained a lot. That's the idea. So basically this parallelism aware scheduler by being parallelism aware, it preserved the bank level parallelism of different threads. And as a result, it saved cycles on one thread because it's the threads data return back much earlier than it would uh, compared to with a baseline schedule. That's the idea over here. And the average stall time of threads, as you can see, is one and a half bank access latencies as opposed to two bank access latencies over here. Okay, so hopefully this is clear. If there are any questions, let me know. And this is really the crux of the observation. The parallelism aware scheduler observes that you destroy the bank level parallelism of threads and it, and it tries to ensure that it doesn't destroy. Okay, so how do you build this uh, in a uh, principled fashion? Uh, we call this parallelism aware batch scheduling. There are two principles. One is parallelism awareness, which is what, what I just told you. Uh, a parallelism aware scheduler schedules requests from a thread to different banks back to back. And the goal is to preserve each thread's bank parallelism. But if you do this indefinitely, this can cause starvation. You basically prioritize one thread's request and threads 
may be generating, keeping on generating requests. As a result, soon you're prioritizing the thread over others for a really long time. Now that didn't sound good to us. So we use another principle called request batching, which is well known in disk systems since 1960s, late 1960s. And the idea here is to group a fixed number of oldest requests from each thread into a batch and service the batch before all other requests uh, are, uh, before all other requests. And you form a new batch when the current one is done. So this ensures that the oldest batch is always, all batch of requests is always serviced before other requests in a given bank. As a result, you never starve, you never, uh, there's no reordering across the batches. Now you can, if, if the bank is free, uh, uh, it can take a request uh, from a newer batch compared to an older batch, but you never prioritize the newer batch over the older batch. Older batch is always prioritized over the newer batch. So clearly this eliminates starvation and provides fairness and also allows a substrate for parallelism awareness within a batch. Now, let me demonstrate this pictorially also. We have these two banks and four threads. Each of them have two requests, one to each bank. And the memory they get backed up in the memory controller because long latencies happen in the banks. Uh, and uh, the memory controller forms a batch, which we will briefly discuss. And the memory controller basically prioritizes uh, thread zero to maximize parallelism and new requests from thread two arrive, but they don't get included in the batch. That's the idea basically, because the batch is already formed. We want to eliminate starvation. And then memory controller takes thread one's request and serves them in parallel. And then thread two's request in the batch and serves them in parallel, but doesn't take thread two's request outside the batch because that would otherwise violate starvation freedom potentially. And then the memory controller takes thread T's request and schedules them. And then it moves on to the new batch. That's the idea over here. Now, this has two components, request batching and within batch scheduling. Within batch scheduling is parallelism aware. So very quickly, I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly because uh, you're not gonna implement this, but I think it's good to know the principles of it because you may actually have some uh, uh, questions. Uh, so why did you pick a batch and a not simple counter as in Atlas? Uh, so you know about Atlas, we're gonna to get to Atlas, but Basically, uh, the reason is really uh, starvation uh, freedom. So this is a much stricter starvation freedom guarantee uh, than uh, what Atlas does. So if you look at Atlas, it's not as fair as this scheduler actually. Uh, this scheduler is much more fair. That's the idea. And this also came before Atlas, but this has value over Atlas because uh, the batching actually enables better fairness. So that's the short answer to your question. Okay, so in the batching, uh, that's a good question. Keep the questions coming. I will uh, keep monitoring them uh, over here. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so basically, how do you how do you do the batching? Each memory requests a bit or marked bit called the mark bit associated with it, and uh, to form a batch, the memory controller marks up to marking cap oldest request for per bank for each thread. And mark requests constitute the batch. And we form a new batch when, the, when no mark requests are left. So it's a very clear algorithm, as you can see. And mark requests are prioritized over unmarked ones. There's no reordering of requests across batches. As a result, there is no starvation and very high fairness, as you will see in the results also. The question is, how do you prioritize requests within a batch? In, in fact, you can use any existing VM scheduling policy, FRFCFS, exploits over for locality. But we also want to preserve intra-thread bank parallelism. We want to service each thread's request back to back. Uh, so to be able to do that, we compute a ranking of threads when the batch is formed. So this paper introduces the ranking of threads that we're going to try to get rid of later on, uh, which is interesting actually, because, but I think ranking still has benefits uh, that doesn't get exploited with Bliss, for example. But basically higher ranked threads are prioritized over lower ranked ones. Uh, and uh, doing so improves the likelihood that requests from a thread are serviced in parallel by different banks because all banks prioritize uh, the different threads in the same rank order. So that's the important part. So if thread one has a request to uh, bank one and bank two, both of them get prioritized over thread two, assuming thread one is ranked higher than thread two. I will give you an example of this. Of course, the question is how do you compute the ranking? Now that becomes interesting. Uh, so thread ranking, uh, let me give you pictorially uh, what thread ranking looks like. So these are two different banks uh, and you can see blue thread uh, and, and red thread over here. If the banks are not aware of uh, the different ranks, 
may, they may actually have contradictory decisions. Basically, they can destroy the parallelism, as you can see, of each thread. Both threads wait. So the key idea is by ranking the threads, one thread over the other one, you reorder the request this way, and you achieve what we discussed earlier. A thread's requests are serviced back to back, and you save cycles. Very similar to what we've seen. That's the idea of ranking, basically. But ranking scheme, exact ranking scheme, affects both throughput and fairness. Ideally, we would like to maximize system throughput and minimize unfairness, equalize the slowdown of threads. And maximizing system throughput actually goes, uh, comes from minimizing the average stall time of threads within a batch. And minimizing unfairness also is helped by minimizing the average stall time, actually. Basically, to minimize unfairness, we want to service threads with inherently low stall time early in the batch. Why? Uh, because delaying some memory non-intensive thread results in high slowdown. So keep in mind, let's assume that a thread has an inherently low stall time of one, another thread has a low stall time of 10. Now let's assume that both of them are delayed by one time unit. So uh, the thread that has the inherently low stall time of one would experience a 2x slowdown, whereas the thread that has inherently has a stall time of 10 would experience a 10% slowdown. So that's the insight over here. Delaying a non-intensive thread with inherently low stall time leads to much higher slowdown for that thread, as a result, much higher unfairness. It turns out prioritizing these non-intensive threads is good for maximizing system throughput also, because it, uh, these threads have lower stall times to begin with. And this leads us to the idea of shortest stall time first or shortest job first ranking. And this has been proven in factory settings, for example, to provide optimal system throughput. In our case, we don't have optimality claims because uh, the memory control is actually much more complicated than a single service system. It has locality, it has parallelism, bank level parallelism, it has locality in the row buffer. So it's very hard to analyze optimality in the memory controller. But basically, the controller estimates each thread stall time within the batch with simple heuristics so that it's implementable. And it ranks threads with shorter stall time higher and prioritizes those threads uh, clearly within the batch. OK, so let me give you an example of this. Uh, basically, this is heuristic based, as I said. Uh, we're going to take into account two heuristic numbers, maximum number of marked requests to any bank. We'll call this max bank load. Uh, basically, the memory controller is going to rank the thread with lower max bank load higher, because this corresponds to lower stall time, again, heuristic based. We're, going to, we're not going to take into account row buffer here because that complicates the analysis, but uh, the paper shows an analysis with row buffer using exactly the same heuristics, and it still works reasonably well. Uh, but if you take into account row buffer hits and misses, then you need to take into account the scheduling policy, et cetera. So that complicates the problem even more. That's why we decided to be simple in this case, especially after the experience of stall time for memory scheduling, which is a really complicated scheduler. And we also have a total number of requests. Mark requests is a, a tiebreaker. We call this a total load. And it breaks ties if uh, threads have the same max bank load. Uh, basically, we rank threads with lower total load higher in the expectation that a less memory intensive thread is likely to have a shorter stall time. OK. Again, these are heuristics. They are not perfect, as uh, I've discussed. OK, so let's take a look at these different uh, threads. And let's compute their max bank load and total load, assuming these are the requests that have arrived at the memory controller at the time. So this is, uh, these are the requests. Uh, you can see, let's take a look at thread zero, for example. So to be able to compute these two values, the memory controller looks at thread zero's request in isolation. Thread zero's max bank load is one. Basically, it has at most one request to any bank. And its total load is three. It has two, three requests to all of the banks. OK, simple, right? Thread one, you look at thread one's request isolation. Its max bank load is two because it has uh, at most uh, two requests to any bank. And its total load is four because it has four requests total to all of the banks. Okay, thread two has at most two requests to any bank. You can see bank one and bank two. And it has three, six requests across all of the banks. And thread three is, has its max bank load is five because it has, has at most five requests to any bank. And uh, total load is nine, as you can see, if you calculate all of the requests over here. As a result, the ranking is simple. Thread zero is ranked higher than thread one, is ranked higher than thread two, and uh, that is ranked higher than thread three. So clearly, we use a tiebreaker rule between thread one and thread two, but everything else is uh, ranked uh, based on the 
max bank load with lower being higher ranked, meaning these are the threads that we want to prioritize within a batch. Okay, so that was hopefully clear. Now let's take a look at what benefit you would get if you use this rank order as opposed to a baseline scheduling order. The paper, as I said, has a more sophisticated example with row buffer hits that shows similar benefits. But I'm going to look at things without row buffer hits. We're going to take row buffer out of the picture to simplify things basically. Okay, let me take a sip over here. So assume that this is the baseline scheduling order, which is the arrival order. We're going to calculate two values for each thread. Well, basically, we're going to calculate the stall times of each thread within the batch. Assume a stall time, assuming that the thread will stall until the end of the servicing of its last request. And this is the time units that I'm going to assume. Okay. So this, if this is the scheduling order, thread zero's last request finishes after time unit four, as you can see over here. So it stalls for four time units. Thread one's last request finishes after time unit four, so it stalls for four time units. Thread two's last request finishes after time unit five, so it stalls for five time units. And thread three's last request finishes after time seven, it stalls for seven time units. So these don't sound good clearly. So basically, uh, the average uh, stall time of threads is pi bank access latencies. But par BS scheduling order takes into account the ranking of the threads within the batch. So within the batch, T0 is prioritized over T1, prioritized over T2, prioritized over T3. So as a result, it's a prioritization order, meaning T0's requests are scheduled in the first time unit, as you can see over here. So it stalls for only one time unit. T2, T1's requests are scheduled this way. So basically, because, in the, because it's a prioritization order, in the first time unit, uh, T1, uh, T0 didn't have any request to bank zero. But because it's a prioritization order, we don't waste bandwidth, meaning we don't dedicate uh, all of the banks to thread zero. But instead, thread one can actually get one of its requests serviced over here. So that's very important. That's a prioritization order. So thread one get, got one of its requests serviced, and thread one's remaining request got serviced in the second time unit, meaning it stalls for two time units. Thread two, as you can see, is filling some of the gaps over here because thread one doesn't have a request in time, second time unit over here. And its requests get scheduled like this. Thread two stalls for four time units, and thread three, poor thread three, stalls for seven time units. But in the end, no one lost performance in this nice example. And aver on average, the throughput improves because overall, uh, you, you get a stall time of three and a half bank access latencies within batch. And as I said, the paper has a more sophisticated example, and we'll see in the performance results that this actually improves performance. Okay, so hopefully this is clear. I think this is a beautiful uh, way of designing memory schedulers. And then the next step is, of course, how do you, what is the scheduling policy? Basically, the scheduling policy looks like this, and the paper evaluates many different combinations of this. Uh, mark requests are prioritized over others. This is the batching part. And parallelism over within batch scheduling parts looks like this. We prioritize row hard bit requests over others in the batch, and then higher rank threads requests over others in the batch and then all the requests over, requests over others. So reversing three, to three and two may be more logical, which we thought also, but it turned out locality was really important. So the overall performance of uh, prioritizing two over three was better, slightly, very slightly actually. So this has three properties that exploits robot for locality and inter-thread bank parallelism. It's worth conserving, as I said earlier, it services unmarked requests to banks without marked requests. So we're not wasting bandwidth. So a schedule is not worth conserving if it's waste bandwidth. Here, if, if there's a request to a bank that's available and there are no marked requests uh, that need that bank, you schedule the request uh, that's not marked, okay? Marking cap is important actually, too small cap and too large cap have problems because if you have too small cap, your batch sizes are small. As a result, you don't exploit the overflow locality as much and maybe also not bank level parallelism. But if your batch size is large, is too too large, uh, the a, a memory non-intensive thread may generate a request while a batch is in being uh, in progress, and it needs to wait until all of the requests in the batch are serviced to the particular bank, uh, so that it can get its turn uh, to access the year. So if you if you choose the wrong thing, you lose performance and or fairness uh, in this case, and the bad pair pair has a lot of results and plus many more trade-offs. So this has also low hardware cost. I'm not going to go into the details, but this is much less costly than uh, complex operations in the uh, 
And as a result, this, this was implemented in real SOCs, as I said, the variants of this. So let me give you very results quickly. These are unfairness results, average across many workloads, uh, based on simulation, of course. These uh, controllers didn't exist at the time we were proposing them. And unfairness is max memory slowdown divided by min memory slowdown, and higher is worse. You can see that existing memory controllers, FRFCFS, FCFS, or network pair queuing based memory controllers actually have a lot of unfairness. Uh, but stall time fair memory scheduling is actually much better than previous memory scheduling, but par BS, parallelism over batch scheduling, even, even better. Because of batching, it enables fairness, and because of uh, stall, shortest stall time first ranking, it also enables better fairness compared to STFM. So basically, it be, it's, it's the best scheduler uh, so far that we've examined. System performance also improves. This is one metric of system performance. You can see the paper for more details. But basically, par BS improves performance uh, significantly compared to the best previous uh, scheduler, which is stall time fair memory scheduling. And you can see that first ready, first come, first serve, and first come, first serve don't really do well over here. And neither does fair queuing based systems, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, the performance improvements come from two reasons, actually. One is uh, you exploit the bank level parallelism. As a result, you reduce average stall times of different threads. Plus, on top of that, you improve fairness. And as a result, you improve core utilization. You don't run into core underutilization problems. So th there, there are two effects that go into performance improvements over here. OK, with that, I'm almost done with PARBS. There are big upsides to this. This is really the first scheduler to recognize the problem that uh, 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 bank parallelism can be destroyed across multiple threads if the scheduler is not designed well. In fact, this was selected as one of the top papers of 2008 at the time. And one of the reviewers wrote uh, a nice comment in their reviews saying that, oh, the problem this paper introduces is extremely critical. One resource that you're designing uh, on the chip, in this case, the memory controller, is really over uh, undoing the huge amount of effort spent in another resource to create bank double parallelism. And that other resource is the processor core. And there are decades of effort actually spent on designing processor cores that can uh, overlap memory requests. And basically, we, uh, the paper realizes that you're really undoing all of that work that you've done in some other resource. And if you combine these two things without thinking, then you have a huge problem, right? I think. That's why the, uh, this work has implications beyond just uh, memory controllers, beyond just the memory controller design, which is adopted in some systems, as I said. But it's really, the implications are bigger. Some resource that you're designing should really take into account uh, the, the assumptions or the performance improvements uh, of some other resource or some other engine that you've designed. And they should really coordinate as opposed to going against each other. And this is really the first work that I know of uh, that has introduced that high level uh, idea uh, within the context of multi-core chips. Okay, it's, a, it's also a simple mechanism compared to STFM. That's why it was easy, more easily adopted. And batching provides much more fairness as we've discussed and starvation freedom and ranking enables parallelism awareness. But the downside of this work is it doesn't always prioritize the latency sensitive applications. And that's where Atlas enabled uh, improvements, but Atlas gave up some fairness in doing so, as we will briefly discuss. Uh, and there may be other downsides. This may not be simple enough, et cetera, but I'm not going to talk about them uh, since we don't have a lot of time. But if you're interested uh, more on PARBS, you can read this work. And this is the paper that, was, uh, that we uh, were invited to write because this was selected as one of the top papers of 2008. And you can read this short paper as well. Okay, so let me talk about Atlas. Are there any questions? I guess, did I miss any questions while looking at the screen? I don't see anything, but feel free to ask. Uh, so Atlas is a much simpler scheduler, actually, and that's one of the reasons why you're implementing it in uh, your lab assignment. We picked the two simplest schedulers, actually, Atlas and Bliss. Bliss is going to be simpler. Atlas is uh, a little bit more complicated because it has some long-term effects. And I'm not going to talk a lot about Atlas in this because I would like you to read and hopefully review the paper and get the bonus points as well, if you're interested. I'm going to give you the high-level idea over here. Uh, but basically, the goal of Atlas is not fairness to begin with. The goal is really to maximize system performance. And the main idea is to prioritize a thread that has attained the least service from the memory controllers so far within the last period, let's say, 
epoch of execution. Uh, that's why it's called Atlas. It's adapter per thread, least attained service scheduling. Okay, that's a mouthful, of course. Atlas is much better. Uh, and the idea is relatively simple. Uh, you basically have counters, a single, single counter per thread uh, that keeps track of how much service the thread attained in the past time intervals, basically how many cycles uh, there, there, were there was a request for the thread that actually was being serviced by main memory. That's the idea. That's the idea of service. If you're waiting in the memory control, you're not getting service. But if you're really being serviced by uh, the memory, at that point in time in the bank, actual service time is really service time. As a result, your counter gets incremented. And for each thread, you have one of these counters. And at the end of the epoch, Atlas scheduler says, OK, I reached an epoch. I'm going to rank these threads based on what I've seen in the previous epoch. I'm going to assume the next epoch is going to be similar. So I'm going to use these rankings in the next epoch. So OK. Uh, in, uh, and, and it enforces the thread ranking in the memory controller during the current interval, next interval, basically. So what is the idea? Basically, threads that have assigned the least service are prioritized in the next interval. Uh, they're, uh, both, of their, both their bank level parallelism is prioritized, as well as their requests are prioritized in the next interval. There's no batching in this case, although batching ideas can potentially be combined with, as well, if possible. Uh, but uh, that's the upside of this. Uh, so uh, it's, 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 it, has, it has this long-term notion of starvation prevention. Batching has the short-term notion. But Atlas has this long-term notion because uh, an epoch is very long, 10 million cycles, as you will see. And uh, you basically co compute the least attained service during an epoch. Actually, you consider previous epochs also. When you read the paper, you will find out that so that you don't change your decisions very quickly. But basically, uh, a thread may attain least service during that epoch. Uh, and then it gets prioritized in the next epoch. Uh, but it, it takes time for that thread to get prioritized, basically. That's the idea. But it gets prioritized in the end. Uh, so why, why does it work? It basically prioritizes light memory non-intensive threads that are more likely to keep their cores as busy as possible. So basically, what this does is clearly light threads that are not memory intensive are by definition going to attain less service from memory controllers. So they get prioritized across all of the epochs, right? That's the idea. So this is really good for throughput. And uh, other threads that are, let's say, much more intensive, uh, they sometimes get prioritized, sometimes don't get prioritized, depending on how much at, uh, service they attain. But light threads almost always get prioritized. So there's some notion of fairness, which is not really perfectly fair. Uh, but clearly, this is good for performance, because light threads that do not access memory a lot are prioritized. And if you prioritize those threads, they're going to quickly get their request serviced and keep their cores busy. Whereas some other heavy threads, if you prioritize them, now uh, you're, you're actually not improving performance because those threads are not actually going to keep their cores busy because by definition, they're going to generate another request, memory request soon, and they're going to stall. That's the idea over here. So it's a powerful observation, clearly. As a result, at the time, it was the highest performance uh, scheduler, as you can see. So this is system throughput. Uh, you can see the metric. It's weighted speed up, actually. Uh, but you can read the paper for more detail. And you can see the sweep. Uh, it's a 24-core system running 24 different applications. So it's a very heavy uh, cloud computing scenario, let's say. And if you look at different memory controllers, I think this is a reasonable system, 24-core system with four memory controllers. This is a very heavily bandwidth constrained system. And this is heavily. Uh, this is a system where bandwidth is very ample. I don't think anyone would design this very costly system. Uh, but basically, you get system, uh, consistently higher system throughput than uh, previous scheduling algorithms. You can see the exact numbers. And the system throughput improves over here more when you're bandwidth constrained. That's good. System throughput reduces, uh, improvement reduces over here when bandwidth is ample. And here, you can see that different scheduling policies perform similarly. Because bandwidth is there's too much bandwidth in memory. As a result, uh, there's uh, the interference is not as problematic. There's less interference, and the effect of interference is not compounded. OK, this is system throughput for a four memory controller system. As you can see, as the number of cores increases, the performance benefit of Atlas increases. So that's also a good observation. And you can see that this is really optimized for performance. In the paper, you can see results for 
uh, harmonic speed up and maximum slowdown, I believe, Atlas doesn't do well uh, in those metrics, unfortunately, because it's really not designed uh, for uh, uh, fairness. Okay, so you're going to implement this in your lab, so hopefully it'll be fun. Uh, this is good at improving overall throughput, that's the big upside. Compute intensive threads are prioritized. It's low complexity, actually, it's one of the lowest complexity schedulers that you will see. Uh, it has, and, and uh, also there's something else you can read in the paper, coordination among controls happens infrequently that I'm not going to harp on over here. Uh, but the downside is the lowest or medium, medium ranked threads get delayed significantly. So this leads to high unfairness. And uh, the next work is going to sol try to solve that problem basically. Okay, so if you're interested, well, I guess uh, if you want to implement your scheduler in lab two, you, you need to go through the paper and take a look but hopefully it's an easy to read paper. And there's also uh, some theory behind it that really I completely skipped and didn't talk about. Uh, least attained service scheduling actually provides you optimal throughput, uh, assuming you're doing shortest job first scheduling, but I'm not gonna talk about that theory at all over here. Okay, uh, so let me talk about uh, the next work, uh, which is thread cluster memory scheduling. And here we're going to be even more aggressive. And we basically want the best of both worlds. So. Okay, we're going to evaluate previous scheduling algorithms so far we've examined. We're going to look at their system throughput, going from left to right is better. And we're going to look at their maximum slowdown, which is a metric for fairness, and going from top to bottom is better. So ideally, you want the memory scheduler to be around here, lowest maximum slowdown and highest weighted speed up. So Atlas has a system throughput bias, as I mentioned multiple times. Par BS has a fairness bias. So neither of them is ideal clearly, but neither of them is not bad. Clearly, PARBS is good for fairness. Atlas is good for system throughput. Okay, STFM is outdated according to these workloads. So it may be better in some workloads clearly than both of these, but according to average across these workloads, it's not good. Uh, and FRFCFS is somewhere over here, as you can see, and FCFS is somewhere over here. Okay, so basically the observation is that no previous memory scheduling algorithm provides the best fairness and system throughput. All of them are biased in some way. Let's take a look at this fundamental reason for bias a little bit. So fundamentally, throughput by, you have two approaches to designing memory controllers or schedulers in general. Throughput biased prioritizes less memory intensive threads, as I said. You would like, really like to prioritize less memory intensive threads that can keep their cores busy. So you rank threads and give higher priority to less memory intensive threads. This is good for throughput, but this is terrible for fairness. The thread that's ranked the lowest stars. Fairness bias approach this is one definition of fairness, of course, but fundamentally, you allow threads to take turns accessing memory. So you do a round robin thread scheduling, let's say. So at some point in time, uh, thread C gets its turn and it can inject its requests. As a result, it doesn't starve. But this poor thread A is not prioritized. So you lose throughput in this case. So basically, there's a single policy for all threads that is insufficient. So we'd like to get the best of multiple worlds, but we're using a single policy and that's not sufficient. So the realization is that you really need a heterogeneous policy to achieve the best of both worlds. So basically for throughput, we would like to prioritize memory non-intensive threads because Prioritizing them clearly improves throughput, and it also doesn't hurt these higher intensity threads. So I call these threads mice. These are small mice, and these are elephants. So if you prioritize some number of mice over elephants, elephants will not even feel it. But the other way around is really bad. If you prioritize an elephant over a mice, then the elephant may kill the mice, right? Uh, but prioritizing the mice is good. Now mice can make very fast progress. As a result, uh, all is good. You get high throughput. Uh, that's the idea over here, basically. We want to prioritize the mice over elephants, not the other way around. That way you improve throughput without hurting fairness and throughput as much for these threads. But for fairness, you need to be very careful about how do you treat these different elephants. Because unfairness is usually caused by these elephants being prioritized over each other unfairly or for long periods of time. That's the realization over here. So we really shuffle the thread ranking such that each of the elephants get priority once in a while regularly. 
And we do a shuffling in an asymmetric manner, which I'm not really going to talk about, but memory intensive threads have different vulnerability to interference. We basically try to adapt the shuffling such that the vulnerable threads get prioritized more often as opposed to not so vulnerable threads with some computation of vulnerability. Vulnerable means basically, if you're deprioritized, you lose a lot more performance. That's the idea. So you shuffle asymmetrically. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of heterogeneity going on here, right? There's heterogeneity in how we diff treat different threads, mice and elephants, for throughput versus fairness. And there's heterogeneity in how we do this thread ranking shuffling, depending on the vulnerability of different threads. So clearly, this is a very complicated scheduler, right? In fact, it's not easy to build. But the basic ideas have uh, paved the way for a lot of other ideas in memory scheduling and other resource management areas. OK. So how do you do this? How do you implement this? Very quickly, you group threads into the two clusters. Uh, threads are hardware context, hardware threads, basically. Memory non-intensive and memory intensive. You have the non-intensive cluster, and you have the intensive cluster. Uh, and you prioritize the non-intensive cluster, as we discussed. And you implement different policies for each cluster, as we've also discussed. Here, you shuffle the thread ranking. Here, you prioritize lower intensity threads over others. OK, so how do you do the clustering? So clustering by itself is not easy, and it's a heuristic in this paper. Basically, we sort the threads based on last level cache misses per kilo instruction, uh, and figure out which ones are elephants, which ones are mice, basically. We attribute a total memory bandwidth usage compute in the previous epoch for these threads, and non-intensive cluster consumes a fraction of that, a small fraction of that. I believe we use 5%, for example, but we vary that. Uh, I guess 10% is the cluster threshold. So I don't remember. This is an old paper, as you can see by now. It's already been 10 years old. OK. Uh, and uh, everything else is the intensive cluster. So clearly, this is a heuristic. And you may go wrong. You may not be accurate. The program may change its behavior. So a lot of things may go wrong. So this is not very robust overall. But overall, you will see good results. Uh, so between clusters, you prioritize non-intensive cluster. As we discussed, it's good for throughput and doesn't degrade fairness mice versus elephants, remember that. But of course, if you prioritize a million mice over elephants, the elephant may fall, right? So you got to be careful over here. Five or six elephants may be OK, but a million elephants may not be OK. So that's a good analogy, I think. OK, within the non-intensive cluster, again, we prioritize threads according to MPKI. Uh, uh, this improves system throughput, again, because least intensive thread has the greatest potential for making progress in the processor. And then the intensive cluster is the most sophisticated and difficult one. And I'm not going to talk about this in more detail than saying that you shuffle thread rankings once in a while. This increased fairness. But we found out that shuffling asymmetrically is better because equal turns is not equal to the same slowdown. So I'm going to skip a lot of these slides because I want to cover the bliss scheduler as well. You can read uh, this in the paper and maybe watch the PARBS talk. I'm going to link the PARBS talk actually from here. Uh, but there's a lot of really interesting information over here. How do you decide which threads are vulnerable, which threads are not vulnerable? Uh, and you can see this in these slides. But in the end, it's quantum-based operation. Uh, you basically compute uh, all of these thread behavior values, memory intensity, bank level presence, and for locality in a previous quantum. And then you decide on the clustering, compute niceness, and decide on the ranking of the threads within the current quantum. And within the current quantum, in the uh, non-intensive cluster, uh, sorry, in the intensive cluster, you shuffle the thread rankings in a much finer granularity so that these elephants don't step on each other for too long. So hopefully that analogy uh, gives you a good idea. If one elephant steps on another elephant for too long, uh, the elephant gets killed. <laughs> Keep that in mind. OK, so this is the scheduling algorithm in the end. Basically, requests from higher ranked threads are prioritized over others. And the rest is like FRFCFS, but highest rank has some uh, care in it. Non-intensive cluster over intensive, non-intensive. Within non-intensive cluster, you have lower intensity, higher rank. And intensive cluster, you do rank shuffling. Basically, you can express everything as a priority or rank value for a given request. And you compare these priority values. OK. Implementation cost as a result is simple, but complexity is relatively high. So cost is low. But the complexity of tracking everything, gathering everything, is not easy. So overall, it's, it will perform better than all of these prior works that we've already discussed, uh, as you will see in the slide. Basically, uh, 
We're going to look at all of these works that I showed you earlier. Uh, system throughput, better on the right axis, fairness, better going from top to bottom. So ideal is over here. And TCM actually on these workloads is much better than everything else. So that's good. But it's not very robust, actually. It turns out you need to tune the parameters really, really carefully to get to this value. So overall, TCM has a robustness problem from this perspective. But it's, it's, it's a proof of concept showing that a heterogeneous scheduling policy provides the best fairness and system throughput. And it also enables fairness throughput trade-off when its configuration parameters vary. So each of these schedulers have configuration parameters, marking cap for PARBS, uh, EPIC for ATLAS, uh, the cap for FRFCFS, for example, and the unfairness, uh, a tolerable unfairness threshold for STFM. And you can change them and you get awkward behavior that looks like this. But if you change the cluster threshold in TCM to some reasonable values, you can, you can actually trade off between fairness and throughput. And all of these are reasonable, reasonable points to operate depending on whether you value fairness or throughput, as you can see. So in terms of fairness and throughput trade off, it's robust, but in terms of performance, it may, it may not be uh, as robust as we think. Okay, so I'm gonna skip the operating system support, but basically operating system can enforce thread weights and it can tune the fairness throughput trade off. So conclusion overall, uh, this is the first scheduling policy that's heterogeneous uh, in terms of its policy and provides the best system throughput and fairness. Okay, let's talk about upsides and downsides. I'm gonna keep you longer and we're gonna make up for it uh, next week, not this week because tomorrow we have actually uh, very interesting lectures as I will tell you at the end of this lecture. Uh, but let me finish this and talk about bliss. Uh, feel free to still ask questions here or in Piazza. Uh, but we're going to make up for the long lecture uh, sometime next week. Uh, so basically, the big upside is uh, uh, it provides uh, both fairness and high performance, which no previous scheduler provide. It also caters to the needs for different threads, different types of threads, latency versus bandwidth sensitive. You can actually categorize in a, in a better way. Not, you don't need to use the categorization that we did, uh, clustering and then identification of different thread properties. That's very intensive, actually, hardware intensive. Uh, you might actually want to use some software level uh, classification also potentially. And that opens up new ideas. And this led to other uh, schedulers that have this sort of latency versus sen bandwidth sensitive characteriz uh, characterization. It's relatively simple, but compared to STFM, it's, less, it's more costly than some other uh, schedulers. Clearly Atlas is less simple, more simple than this. And clearly Bliss, which we're going to discuss is going to be simpler than this. Uh, and also uh, Power BS is also simpler than this actually. So downside is how do you scale this to large buffer size? It turns out there's a problem. Uh, robustness of clustering and shuffling algorithms. I mentioned there are issues here and ranking is still too complex actually, as we will discuss. But still, this was actually a very well received paper. This was also uh, one of the uh, top picks, even though I don't show it in the slide uh, in the year it was written. Okay, uh, so I don't see any questions. So I'm gonna very briefly give an overview of this blacklisting memory scheduler since this is going to be one of the schedulers that you're going to implement in your lab three. I mean, you can read the paper also, of course, but uh, having the overview before reading the paper uh, definitely helps, I think. So basically, uh, this paper takes a fresh look. Uh, you can see it was written four years after thread cluster memory scheduling, uh, and clearly uh, about eight years after we started uh, working on memory scheduling, uh, or we started, let's say. Uh, it basically takes a fresh clean slate approach and it basically questions everything. And it's good to do that once in a while for your own research, for others' research. Uh, in the end, uh, we need to think critically about everything. So what it does is it tackles inter uh, basically uh, applica inter-application interference is tackled by application over memory scheduling. It recognizes that. It basically says there are two ways, two things that go into building application over memory schedulers today, monitoring and then ranking. You monitor applications or threads somehow, uh, and based on some characteristics, as we've discussed, like intensity could be one, you rank the threads. And then once you do that, you enforce the ranks in some epoch, in the next epoch, let's say. Okay, interval. Epoch is the same thing as interval. And this ranking, you can see this is how it's implemented. This is, of course, pictorial. You basically need to do a comparison of the rank of each request to the highest rank. Uh, application ID at that point in time. And uh, you basically pick the request from the highest rank application ID, okay? So this is not simple, as you can see, it adds complexity 
you can you can actually try to simplify it as much as possible. Yes, there are many ways of implementing it, but in the end, it adds complexity. No question about that. If you want to obey these ranks, you need to have some level of complexity. And this uh, paper actually has a very nice analysis of all of these different schedulers. Uh, I mean, it doesn't optimize extremely all of the schedulers, but it shows that it's hard to meet some of the latency requirements of the schedulers, uh, uh, of uh, latency requirements of DDR systems with some of these schedulers because some things are complex. So full ranking increases critical path latency and area, and it's significant uh, to improve performance and fairness. So let's take a look at how different schedulers uh, behave in terms of performance, fairness, and simplicity. Now we're going to take into account simplicity. So this work is complex because it takes into account multiple metrics now. And whenever you talk about three metrics, it's not easy to quantify. So we're going to quantify things using plots that look like this. Ideal is going to be the farthest most of each. FRFCFS goes like this, basically. It's very simple, but it's not good at fairness or performance. And it's application unaware. So uh, it's very simple, as I said, but low performance and fairness. All of these other schedulers, Power BS, Atlas, TCM, are application aware schedulers, and they are in different parts uh, of this uh, depiction, as you can see. So Power BS is not simple, as you can see, but it's fair and reasonably high performance. Atlas is much simpler than Power BS, but not as simple as FRFCFS. Uh, but it's not fair, you can see, uh, but it's better performance, it turns out, in these works than uh, Power BS. Uh, and TCM is uh, over here, as you can see, according to this implementation, uh, but it's also not getting closer. Uh, it's, it's really not good for simplicity, as you can see. So these are application aware, and you can see that they're all complex. So the key question this works asks, uh, after rethinking for some amount of time, is is it essential to give up simplicity to optimize for performance and or fairness? And basically the solution that it proposes achieves all three goals in a simple way. And the answer is no, basically. You don't want to give up simplicity to optimize for performance and fairness. The solution is not going to be the best in all metrics, clearly. Clearly, we're not going to be better than this, whatever this was over here. I believe it was Atlas. Uh, yeah, I think it's Atlas, basically. Uh, we're, gonna, we're not going to be as good as Atlas, but we're going to get close to it. But we're going to be much simpler. Uh, well, I guess this may be par, par BS. Don't, don't take my word for it at this point. I believe it was par BS. OK, yes. So in terms of performance, we're going to be better than Atlas, I think. Uh, in terms of fairness, we're not going to be as good as par BS. OK, so the key observation is actually grouping rather than ranking. Ranking is very fine grained. And uh, it has a lot of issues. But one of the issues is complexity, clearly. And the observation that this paper makes is a novel observation. It's sufficient to group, separate applications into two groups rather than do a full ranking across all of the threads. So we monitor as opposed to ranking. We're going to group the threads into two groups, vulnerable and interference causing. And I really like this approach. It's a really new insight, I think, uh, because you really want to do this. Uh, you don't want to, the, the full purpose, I, I think one of the reasons uh, one of the other reasons that this paper ignores of ranking is parallelism awareness. So we're, it's not going to exploit parallelism awareness as good as some of the other schedulers, but overall its performance is going to be still good. So it's going to exploit some parallelism awareness across vulnerable interference causing groups, but not as good as full ranking. So remember why we introduced ranking? It was parallelism awareness. We're going to, we're going to get rid of that. We're going to exploit some parallelism awareness, but we're going to make things much less complex. And uh, we're going to take a more quality of service or fairness approach. So uh, clearly, vulnerable uh, group and interference causing group are separated. And we're going to prioritize vulnerable group over interference causing group. So this leads to a huge, uh, lower, much, much lower complexity compared to ranking. OK, then the next question. It also leads to lower slowdowns than ranking, because ranking is not easy to get right, actually. How do you shuffle the ranking? Uh, who do you prioritize? It's very fine grained. Whereas this coarse, uh, whereas this coarse grained approach, uh, vulnerable interference causing is easier to manage. Let's say so decisions are easier to get right, and also this is a place where I would inject machine learning. This is a place where machine learning could play a good role and improve performance and fairness significantly. But it may be complex, but that complexity may be warranted. So keep in mind, uh, there's no work as far as I know that tackled, that looked into these from a machine learning perspective. Okay, but I don't want to derail given that we're already out of time. Then the next question is, how do you classify applications to groups? And this paper also has a novel observation. 
there are two uh, novel observations. The second observation is serving a large number of consecutive requests from an application actually causes interference whenever there's a request from some other application waking. So basically the idea is to group applications with a large number of consecutive requests as interference causing. So we blacklist some applications and we deprioritize the blacklisted applications for a while. And the blacklists are uh, cleared periodically, very quickly actually, thousands of cycles. You don't need to wait millions of cycles. So this is a very dynamic fine-grained approach to deprioritizing some applications and forming and unforming the groups. Uh, so basically, if an application, uh, let's say, creates five requests that are, uh, that are serviced uh, consecutively, uh, we blacklist of that application, and it gets deprioritized in the next thousands of cycles, and then it becomes higher priority again. But in during those uh, thousands of cycles, it's not going to destroy the performance of others because it gets deprioritized. It goes into the, uh, the interference-causing group. You may be wrong. But again, you don't hurt performance that much. The indication is that uh, the application is in a streak of generating a lot of requests, so less limited. I mean, we're not limiting it uh, for good. We're actually just deprioritizing it, right? So it's not, uh, it's not a very heavy-handed approach in the end. It's a very dynamic approach. That's why you get a lot of benefits. So you get lower complexity, that's one benefit, but you also get finer grained grouping decisions. As a result, you get lower unfairness and you're very dynamic in terms of these decisions. As a result, uh, this is the uh, performance, fairness, and simplicity that Power BS gets. Uh, I think it's not the best in any metric. I mean, it may be best actually in performance. Uh, well, it is highest performance actually. It's close to fairest and it's close to simplest. And it's close to scheduler to ideal, assuming ideal is defined by uh, the scheduler that has the highest fairness, highest simplicity, and highest performance at the same time. So you can see there's a performance and fairness trade-off over here. I'm not going to harp into it because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, but you can see that uh, blacklisting uh, achieves the highest performance compared to, uh, let's see, over TCM over here. Uh, and it balances performance and fairness. So it's not as fair as Power BS. So Power BS is still quite good, as you can see. And it turns out in these applications, FRFCFS is also good in terms of fairness which is surprising, but uh, it, it really depends on your application mix. That's one of the issues with the memory scheduling. The results that you get, it really depends on your application mix and you will see this in your projects also, I think. Uh, so I think a robust memory scheduling algorithm that is really great at all of the application mixes is still elusive, that still remains. I think machine learning could have a say over here again. So if you look at complexity, uh, ideal is over here. But this is critical path latency, ideally wants zero. The schedule area ideally wants zero. FRFCFS is closest over here. Uh, clearly, uh, PowerBS is not good over here. And it turns out the TCM implementation here is better than TAR PowerBS here. And you can see that uh, blacklisting reduces complexity significantly compared to TCM. And it gets very close to FRFCFS uh, cap over here in FRFCFS, which is underneath FRFCFS cap over here. So you can see Atlas is still more complex, uh, which is interesting because as you will see in your assignments, uh, you will need to take into account some complexity. OK, so more on Bliss. This is, this is the first paper that was written uh, by it. Uh, it was actually rejected by uh, some conferences. That's why we published an ICCD. Uh, we got a lot of annoying comments, uh, which I may go into later on. But uh, people were not able to really understand the distinction of this from TCM, but hopefully you do now. Uh, but later we extended this version to uh, with a lot uh, of evaluations we already had, but we couldn't fit into the journal uh, conference paper. So if you're really interested in more sophisticated evaluation, uh, you should read this longer version, I would suggest. Okay, so this is a great place to stop. Uh, I don't see any questions and we don't really have time for questions. We're already out of time. Thanks for your patience. Uh, we'll make up for it, but I really wanted to cover Bliss because you're going to uh, implement it in your lab. Uh, but uh, I think today we're done with memory controllers. In the future, we may have another lecture on quality of service. At this point, I'm not sure uh, if we will. But tomorrow, we're going to have another exciting session on uh, some ongoing research in DRAM uh, and processing in memory uh, and uh, 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 yeah, uh, and, and processing in memory, essentially. So I would suggest att uh, attending the uh, tomorrow's session.
you will learn about the UPMM architecture, for example, which is a processing in memory engine. And we're going to talk about uh, the virtual block interface, which is a new way of approaching virtual memory with hardware software cooperation. So that, that's going to be an example of a data aware design, which we haven't talked about yet, for example. So tomorrow is going to be, again, four uh, lectures uh, from my students and postdocs. So hopefully it'll be very interesting. OK, so this is where I will stop at this point. Uh, again, thanks for your attention and uh, see you tomorrow.